we're okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I think this may be our largest crowd yet, which is fantastic. Um, so just out of curiosity, who is uh, here for the first time at Tech Foundations? Excellent. Excellent. That's good. Um, and who all here is from Google? Excellent. All right. So, I'd like to see. so, um, so yeah, uh, as always, uh, welcome to Tech Foundations, uh, a kind of speaker series type thing that I put together to uh, kind of help introduce people to the world of technology uh, through introductory level topics geared towards the world new or entering the uh, development and tech world. So, um, don't really have any major announcements, uh, so pretty much we'll get right into this one. Uh, so our speaker today is Daniel Waddell. Uh, Daniel has been, uh, I've known Daniel through the Google program, he's mentored with us four or five times, maybe six, something like that. Yeah, yeah and um, with a driver before then, so. Yeah. That's right, yeah, so yeah, he's been uh, in and out of the program for a while. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about his background here in a moment, so I won't uh, steal thunder, but basically he's with B2B currently, and formerly with um, Scholarly Art, Scholar RX, and then before that, ACTC, uh, which is where he was at in the middle. So, uh, he's here to talk about uh, APIs tonight, which is something that no programmer can ever avoid in their career. So, uh, it's a very important topic, and I look forward to hearing about it. So, with that, take it away, Dan. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so, this, uh, uh, this talk is an introduction to web APIs, so we're not going to talk about a specific technology a lot. It's more about the terminology around it. Uh, like Brian said, my name is Daniel Waddell. I throw the C up here because I'm C.D. E. Waddell on everything. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I have been doing this for 15 years now, officially. It was like last month was 15 years. So in my free time, I like to you know, mix music, uh, for live bands, uh, make movies, and develop video games. Uh, you can connect with me. Feel free to hit me up on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, there's my GitHub account. You can peruse that to see some of the stuff that I do in my free time. Uh, I'm not actively on Twitter. I just feel obliged to throw it up here. Uh, <laughs> maybe one day. Do amazing things there. Uh, so I do work for HMB. Um, we are a, a solutions company in the IT realm, so we help businesses meet their goals by helping them solve their hard problems. So you can feel free to reach out if you have a, a hard problem to solve. Uh, we can probably help you there. So, groundwork. What is an API? So an API, in its simplest form, is a way that one computer programmer can let some, another computer programmer use their work. So it is an interface layer that people write to open up their logic. So uh, in a simple term, it allows two pieces of software to talk to each other, um, but not quite like this, because software doesn't talk with a natural language, and natural language processing is hard, so why would you do it the hard way? So it is broken into three um, rough groups, API architecture is. The first one is your low level stuff. So this is your operating system. So in order to like show something on a screen, you have to tell the computer to show it. And so Microsoft has written uh, code to allow you to do that in the Windows API. Uh, Unix has their own API. Uh, everybody has APIs for different devices to do this. And the computer programming languages that you might use uh, abstract that. So you don't have to go through the hard work of communicating over some kind of cord to a monitor. Uh, it's, it's all taken care of for you. You just say, hey, show this. And the, the operating system will take care of that. We're not dealing with this today. This is like some high-level computer science stuff that uh, I've long since forgotten. Uh, the, a, a common one if you're in the front-end web development realm or the back-end are package managers. They allow you to install other people's software, basically, libraries. And these libraries have their own APIs. So when you're interfacing with somebody else's code, that is also an API. But it's a software-level API. 
Um, so when you're using NPM for your front end uh, code global class, um, you, you might be interfacing with somebody else's APIs. But we're also not talking about these today, because we're uh, razor focused in on the third type, which is web-based web APIs. So it's a way that a computer programmer can put on the internet a, almost like a, a business logic layer behind a service so that you can request information from their work and augment your work with it. So you can make a richer experience from your users off of somebody else's work. There are a lot of terms that have come up over the ages to declare like the types of web APIs that are out there. And this is a rough progression of like where it's come from and where it is now. So in the, in the beginning we had remote procedure calls, which were very rough. Uh, uh, we introduced what's called REST, which is something we're gonna talk about today. And then SOAP, SOAP was this huge thing that allowed you great powers. And you might uh, come across SOAP if you work in the software development field. But um, with that great power, you, you have a lot of configuration and it's very difficult to use. There are some new things on the field, like GraphQL, that you'll probably hear a lot of people talking about. GraphQL uh, is, a, is a really good web API layer, but once again, it's a little complicated. So we're gonna focus today on what's called REST, um, which is a, a resource-based API. And when you're working in any backend code, by default, it's gonna let you develop RESTful APIs pretty easily. So, what can you do with other people's APIs? The landscape is huge. Like there is a lot of data that you can interface with and augment your work with their work. Uh, we're gonna go over some cool ones kind of at the end but for business purposes, like if you need to send a text message to somebody, there's a really good one in here called Twilio. You just like call a line of code that they've written for you, and then somebody gets a text message instantly. They even give you free text messages, like uh, up to a few uh, thousand or so a month. I don't remember the exact number. Um, emails the same way, uh, faxes, uh, online forms. So if you need to collect data around forms. You can also just use Google's API and, and have that form like write to a spreadsheet. Uh, E-commerce platforms, if you need to sell something, there are all kinds of APIs around that. Uh, so all you do is say, this person's buying this product for this amount of money, and then they take that information and uh, collect the, the credit card information and do the payment. Um, Human services, HR, there's a lot of uh, artificial intelligence APIs out there so that you don't have to do the hard work of artificial intelligence. You just leverage their work. Now, a lot of those get a little expensive, but they are available. Microsoft has a really good product for artificial intelligence. Um, there's also like testing and management, kind of the business side of software development that you can tie into. Uh, back-end tools, and then there's some like APIs that help you write your own APIs. Like so, like it's, it's almost like a meta API. But it, it's all available and we're gonna go over some of these. Uh, actually some of, they're not even up here, the ones we're gonna go over because they're, they're not as business friendly useful. So, how do you get from a device or a, um, a phone, for instance, or a laptop into an API infrastructure. Well, uh, when you're navigating the web, you can oftentimes uh, see when a website is, is doing just this. So if you uh, were in the front end global class, you might, or front end development class at Code Global, you might have uh, learned about the developer tools. So one of these days, just open your developer tools and just kind of see what it's doing because this is just loading this Google page. Now a lot of mine are red because I've got ad blockers on, 
and most of the APIs being called on this page are for advertising purposes, telling different people exactly what I'm doing so they can collect that information and aggregate it and feed me advertisements. But, uh, so pretty much every one of those red ones is, a, is, a, uh, is an API uh, specifically around advertisement targeting. And you, you can do the same thing, just hit F12 and just like navigate the web and this network tab will just like continually fill up. Has anybody done that before? Just like randomly browsing the web and like shocked at how much stuff is happening in the background? So, you can see this data, but how does this, how does this uh, system work? Well, um, in order to have a web API, we have to introduce some server architecture, which if you're in the back end code global classes, that's kind of the topics that you're building around. And web APIs always have to be built in some sort of back end technology. But why would you want to use an API? Well, first off, you get a shared business logic layer. So if you have somebody using a, lap, a tablet or a laptop, and you have somebody else using a, a native smartphone app, and then somebody else is using a, a PC, either Windows or Linux, if we were in a, a native world, we would have to write software, business logic, in four different languages or write it in one common language and compile it into multiple devices. Well, with a web API, uh, all of these technologies can communicate to a server, but not getting user interface, not getting the, 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 um, the, the user layer, the, um, just getting the logic. So they're not seeing anything coming from the internet, they're just getting data from the internet. You can also instantly update for all of these users. Anybody who's uh, written an application that spans devices will know that when you introduce a bug into your system, it is gonna take a very long time for all of your users who are using that buggy version to be off that buggy version. So and, uh, Android is the worst because they don't force update people very often, so you're left like with an older version until you decide to update it. Like you know, they might be a little, uh, they might nag you a little bit and say, "Hey, you have updates, but until that user runs the update, they're going to run the buggy version of your code." Well, if you have a server architecture for your business logic behind some kind of web API, then you can have. Uh, that line of logic isolated, and you can fix the bug for all users, no matter what version they're on. Um, you can also analyze data in one place across your entire user base, which is a really powerful thing that, that you get from, uh, from server-based APIs. So, uh, it's really easy to, uh, um, get this communication going, but, but what, is the, what are the technologies around identifying like which users are doing which things so you can keep track of that information? Well, uh, the web has come up with many solutions for this, the oldest of which um, doesn't quite equate to the web API of modern times. Uh, you might be fairly familiar with it. Um, So, the web for years has been based around cookies. Uh, not that kind of cookie. Uh, fortunately, my job would be a lot better than it was. But, uh, uh, and they're still used today. They do still have a place. But that place is not for your web APIs. So let's uh, talk about how cookies work. Because you kind of need to know how cookies work to know how web APIs do their authentication. So cookies are fairly simple. Um, you're sent to a login page, and uh, you get a cookie uh, on most websites you go to for authentication, like uh, accounts.google.com is a good example. So if you go to the login for Google, 
you're going to provide them with your username and password, and then they're going to give you a cookie, and now you are logged into um, Google's site. But you're only logged into accounts.google.com. You're not logged into Gmail. You're not logged into any of their like other infrastructure just by going to accounts.google.com. So cookies are great for a single site application because browsers keep cookies secret from other websites. So your, your cookie is only valid for the one website that that cookie was set from. And that's what makes it hard to uh, share. It's usually used in conjunction with a single sign-on like I was talking about, so Google uses cookies. Um, it, it is also optionally persistent. So if you close your browser and then you reopen your browser, most of these websites keep you logged in. You're, you don't have to re-log in to accounts.google.com to use their infrastructure. So then how, do, how does their uh, system, oh, so uh, this is another example uh, to kind of better demonstrate this. So if, if you have domain number one and domain number two, like accounts.google.com and gmail.com, because the cookies are secret, they're kept isolated for, from one another. So if you wanted authentication in the old days, with cookies, then each site would have to log you in separately, which makes your users furious if you have that infrastructure. Nobody wants to log in more than once. So how do these systems work then? So they use a system called a token-based authentication, uh, which is basically uh, various, uh, a section of it is what we just talked about this authentication service. So accounts.google.com is an example of an authentication service. So you, um, when you go to, let's say, uh, gmail.com, Gmail is first going to send you over to accounts.google.com, a whole different domain. And that's where your cookie gets set. If you already have one, it's going to instantly just send you back. So you're never going to notice that you even left the web page except a slight flicker. Uh, the flicker is the worst on bank websites. Many people have logged into their bank and it's like flash, 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 flash. Then it finally loads. Because they have so many like layers that they're making sure you're authenticated in, and then they also have third-party providers that are making sure you're not a hacker as you're going. Um, well, anyway, it sends you back to your app with what's called a token. Um, that token is now useful uh, on that website, and it's also useful to be passed to web APIs so that the web APIs can know exactly who you are. Um, so let's take a look at an example of one of these tokens. So um, by default, they're scrambled. They are not encrypted. So you can actually take a look at uh, one of these tokens using F12 tools. Um, uh, and you can copy it, and you can paste it into a website and decode it and see what data is in it. Um, so you're going to have some header data that's irrelevant. It just is talking about the technology behind the token. You're going to have some payload, which is going to be the information that defines who you are. But then you're going to have a signature session. Now this is the part that makes it hack-proof because they basically... Uh, encode the top part, and then they sign it cryptographically to make sure that you can't go in here and make changes and then start sending that token around. One common mistake a lot of web API uh, writers do is not check that signature. If you've written a web API and you have accepted a JWT token, which is what you're seeing here, and you don't validate that signature, then I can get a token for my account and then come in here and change like the sub, which is the user ID, and then I can be anybody that I want. So you, you do need to make sure that you are checking these tokens if you ever start writing or are writing web APIs. Most libraries that handle this for you, they do that, that check, so you don't have to worry about it, but it is a very integral part. Uh, we can even see, if you want, uh, we can uh, take a look at a, um, a 
a JWT token. So this is an example token that uh, I generated uh, using a, a product that I'll show you here in a second. I used to have this installed. Uh, token decoder. <coughs> JWT.io is the website. And you can come down here and you can take your encoded token and you can paste it in. And you'll see here that uh, this is a, a blog application that I've written for a different talk. And it's what I'm going to demonstrate the uh, uh, sort of web API of communication in. And uh, if you notice here, I've got, some, I've got some payload information. But my application doesn't care who the user is except for their uh, sub. Like all I care is their user ID. I don't care their email address or first or last name. But that piece of information is important to me. Now I'm going over quite a few pieces of technology. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? I can take hands if anybody has one. But feel free to stick your hand up and I'll, I'll keep an eye out and, and try to call on you. Uh, let's see. Where we were. It was tokens. Now, sometimes you might be writing a web API and you don't care who the user is. You just need to make sure that you know. Uh, that they're allowed to be yeah. into your system. So a lot of APIs that you might interface with and the ones that are on the list that I showed you earlier are typically not going to have you log in. They're just going to have you generate what's called an API key. And that key is meant to be secret and it's only usable by you. And because the API provider is going to tie limits to that key, and then they're going to start charging you for usage at a certain threshold. Like oftentimes you get APIs for free up to like, I don't know, a thousand requests a day. And then, and then if you go beyond that, you have to start paying. So these API keys are the way that they distinguish who's using their system. Uh, and we'll, we'll go over some documentation on how to generate these. Everybody generates them differently, but most APIs that you might look up, you just go to the website, type in some information, and then just click Generate Key. So some common gotchas with APIs. There's a thing called cores, which is uh, a cross-origin request problem. Um, browsers don't like domain one calling resources on domain two because Domain two might be giving out sensitive information that that user's not, not supposed to see, and it might be a hacker trying to bypass some security. So it wasn't that long ago, maybe 2016, that we really started seeing this take off, uh, where uh, if you had integrated with an API from a browser, uh, the browser is going to just throw an error and say you're not allowed to do this. And uh, to fix it, the service provider has to actually provide information that says you're allowed to call this API. And that's this access control allow origin. Don't expect you to remember that, that's long, but if you ever like use your FTL 12 tools when you're interfacing with something and you see that error, um, you kind of know that this server doesn't allow you to use your service like this. Even businesses that we're gonna go over, who their only job is APIs, they sometimes don't add this in. And if you're calling their API from a browser, it's gonna be a problem. If you're calling it from backend code, server to server API calls, uh, this does not matter. Uh, you, you can totally ignore it. And there's very little way around this security aside from uh, getting the, the uh, service provider to, to change their end. I'm surprised that more of them haven't. In the demo that I put together for this class, I actually had to, to create a layer in between the API to get around one of these. So, um, so to get just a little bit deeper into API design, 
there are some guidelines that uh, are really best to follow. So if you are going to be a back-end developer, it might be good to, to, to kind of remember these. The first is to do intelligent versioning. So if you create an API um, and you uh, um, uh, are opening that up to the world, especially if you're opening it up to the world, if it's an internal API, you don't have to worry about this as much. But if you're, if if it's being installed on devices, uh, the the code to access this API, then uh, you need to have intelligent versioning in your system because of that same problem we talked about earlier with updates. So if, if uh, somebody has your Android app version one, and you come out with version for two of your Android app, and it calls your APIs, well you needed to make changes to your business logic to make that function for version two, otherwise you wouldn't need a version two. Um, those people who don't update are gonna still be hitting your old APIs, and those APIs are gonna just die. You're gonna, your users are just gonna be at big error screens saying, uh, you can't do this. Uh, so it's, it's good to have versioning. Um, the use of HTTP verbs to communicate intent, we're gonna go over these verbs in a second, so I'm not gonna cover that very deep. Uh, status codes are another thing we're going to cover. Uh, predefining error responses. This is good for consumers of APIs too. So when you're reading the documentation for an API, they're going to say, when you make a mistake, you're going to see a response that looks like this. And it's going to have uh, usually a JSON object, if you're familiar with JSON, which is just a way to communicate data from the server to a user. Um, and it's going to look like this when there's an error, so that you can show your user what went wrong. Uh, oftentimes, people forget this step, so they'll, they'll call an API, there will be a problem, and they won't give the user any feedback. It'll just be problem, and then you can't, you can't fix it. When it could be like, uh, uh, please fill in your first name, it's required. Well, if you don't tell the user that, and you're using an API, then they're going to be left in the dark. Uh, endpoints should be nouns and not verbs. Uh, this is a RESTful practice uh, because uh, RESTful is around resources. So it's managing resources. And if your APIs are managing resources, then uh, it's best to communicate that intent to the user by using nouns that represent the resources. If you start using verbs, then you're actually adding an intent to your, like, this is used when you want to do this. But that can be confusing and cause you to have multiple endpoints that are very common and do the same thing. Uh, get requests, which a get is one of the verbs we're going to cover in a second. And query parameters should never alter the state of an application. And I'll go over why in just a second. Filtering, paging, and sorting should be built into your API, and most APIs that you're going to interface with are going to have this if you're going to be getting more than a thousand things back. So you should always put the paging and sorting on the back end, especially if you have a million pieces of information that you're providing. Like nobody wants to do that on the client side, and you're going to pay a lot of bandwidth to uh, send out a million records to all your users. So let's go over status codes. Anybody, are you familiar with status codes? Show of hands. Okay, there are some pretty simple ones. Uh, a 200 is everything's good. And really, all of the 200 category is everything's good. So you can kind of ignore that one because, uh, hey, it worked. Uh, 400 means the client did something wrong. So when you see a 400 response, it means that the user is not logged in. Uh, they ask for something that is not there. You might actually see this a lot in just regular web browsing, the 404 response. Uh, conflict, it's, it's always important in API design to use these. So if somebody was asking for information about a user from your API, and that user doesn't exist, then you should return a 404, because a 404 means I can't find the resource that you're looking for. Now, 500s, on the other hand, mean the, means the developer on the API that you are interfacing with 
did something wrong. So back end problem are 500s, uh, front end problems are 400s. There are some uh, little caveats in here, like this uh, uh, 504 and 502, which can be the user's internet isn't working or their ability to communicate with, their, with the server you're running. Like uh, 502 and a 504 could be uh, a router has gone out somewhere between the user and your server. So there's not much a developer can do about that. I did uh, have an instance where my API last year, a really heavily used API, was returning a bunch of 504s and I knew that because they were logging it to our logging server, which was in the same data center. So if they were able to communicate with the logging server, why were they getting 504s on my server? And we, we never did figure it out. But it went away. So it fixed itself. <laughs> uh, we filed a blood bug with Microsoft. They couldn't explain it either. Uh, but their requests were never getting to our server, even though it was in the same data center. So let's talk about the verbs. Uh, these verbs are ways to communicate intent that I was talking about. And you should really try to isolate your interactions with your servers to these five intents, which are CRUD operations. Create, read, update, delete. So uh, get requests on a resource endpoint. If everybody can see that it's requesting the tasks URL without anything after it. That is the intent to receive all tasks. Hopefully there's paging and sorting there if there are a lot of tasks. The second get request is that same tasks endpoint, but now there's an ID that comes immediately after it. So that uh, um, shows the intent of asking for a specific task. Post to the tasks endpoint is typically to create a new task. Or it can also be update if you populate the ID. There's a, in the developer community, there's a theological commun uh, <laughs> argument of whether uh, posts can be updates or not. Most software developers just go ahead and put it in there. Uh, puts are specifically around updates. Um, so you, you do a, the exact same post as before, but inside of the URL that you're posting to, is the ID of the object you want to update. A delete um, is also issued to a specific or a collection, but a delete on a collection means uh, clear them out. We don't want any more of them, so uh, deletes on collection endpoints aren't usually that common. There are some more that I don't have up here um, because they get a little tricky. There's one called a patch. Yeah, patch. Patch is not up here because uh, even today there are some uh, web technologies that don't support patch. So you can experience some bugs around that. Microsoft now uses it fairly heavily in their software, in their APIs, mainly around VSTS or DevOps, whatever they're calling it today. Um, that, and it's specifically around when you want to update partially an object. And it's really handy if you have an object that takes up a gigabyte of data. So if you have this one massive object, and all you want to do is change this user's first name, you don't want to have to post back a gigabyte of data to just update somebody's first name. So patch allows you to say, my intent is to change these fields that I'm sending you and nothing else. I only want to change a first name, or I only want to change an address, and I'm just omitting the other data. I, I really don't want you to nullify all the other data on this user. Just want you to do those, those three things. Yeah, no, please, go ahead. Are the endpoints going to be the same for the patch? Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was, are the endpoints going to be the same? Yes, yeah, so if you notice, we do have like our get and our put and our delete are all the same like URL. And for a patch, we're gonna have the same thing. So a put's gonna look just like a patch, but you don't have to send all the data with it when you send it to the server. Patches in most web technologies and backend, if you're building APIs, 
you have to program them yourself. Like, you're not going to get a nice, solid library that implements patch for you. Uh, I'm sure it'll come eventually, but it's, if anybody knows about one, please uh, you raise your hand. Talk about it after this presentation, too. I'd like to know what it is, because I've looked. So uh, we, we talked about these. And uh, the one small caveat, if you're going to use patch, you do have to support uh, a weird header technology that is called XHTTP method override. Because a lot of these web technologies that are gateways that set in the middle that don't support patch, they turn patches into posts. So on the back end, you have to turn them back into patches. I know that might be a little deep for some front end developers in here. It's just a real weird caveat that you have to, you have to program for. So also uh, with uh, HTTP verbs, you have to deal with what's called <laughs> idempotence. I think that's how you say this. I would never really hear anybody say it. I just read it. Um, but it's the ability to repeat uh, an action on an API or on a web website. A uh, show of hands, who have, has used the back arrow on a web browser and all of a sudden been presented by a little frowny face that says, are you sure you want to resend this data to the server? Yeah, uh, most people. Uh, that's because a programmer didn't correctly uh, do post redirect um, for sending data to the server. And it is because posts are explicitly not allowed to be resent. So browsers will actively not resend the same post more than one time because the browsers correctly implement the, the uh, HTTP uh, framework. Now that doesn't mean you can't code for it in your end, but it really means posts are supposed to change the state of your system, and multiple posts can change it in unexpected ways. Um, so browsers will actively avoid that. Uh, and that's the reason that you should always have your create endpoints be posts. Because all of these other ones are fair game for your browser to repeat without you wanting it to. So uh, patches, they don't, but according to the standard, you can. Uh, and puts are the same way. Like, so browsers will actively do these multiple times, even though you don't want them to. Uh, I remember when they first introduced this, uh, um, the uh, product in Chrome, which was called prefetching, it was like in 2013-ish. So Chrome, in order to give users a better experience, would issue a GET request before you had even loaded your browser. Like it would do it behind the scenes, and it would do it based on what you're typing in the address bar. And so it was predicting what you were gonna go to based on your behavior patterns, and it would go ahead and load that in the, in the back end. And, but if that wasn't what you were gonna do, it might load something else or it might cause two GET requests. And there were a lot of web technologies out there that like uh, tried to find people trying to break into your system with multiple GET requests and, and these uh, security headers for posts, and it would invalidate some of those when they first introduced that. So GET requests should never change the system. It should only provide data to a user. So versioning, uh, you might come across several of these if you're interfacing with third-party APIs. So sometimes, and this is my preference, I don't know if, uh, if anybody else, uh, like this is another theological debate around uh, 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 APIs, like how you version. There are three common methods for versioning. The, the one I prefer is by URL, so you actually explicitly in the URL say, you are accessing version one of the API right now. Another uh, common method is a custom header that, so the requester has to say what version they're doing, but that's up to the programmer to set. Uh, the nice part about this second one is if they don't set anything, you usually get latest. So you can be on the bleeding edge, but it might not work with your program. Um, 
because they might have introduced a breaking change. And the third one is to use headers that are already there, called the accept header. Now, if you're a front-end web developer and you're uh, wanting to call back-end web APIs, these headers are something that it's a good idea to become familiar with, especially accept, because that's how you tell the server what data you expect. Like, in this case, the developer expects JSON data back, and they want version 1.0 of the API. But I much prefer having the intent stated directly in the URL. And uh, that's typically what I think you'll come across if you start using other people's web APIs. Um, so when should you version? So if the data you expect from the user changes in a breaking way, that's really the, the main time that you're going to actually introduce a new version. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if uh, you have a field on your user object called full name, it's like how you specify the user's name, and you've decided to break that into first name and last name. If you change your existing API to no longer have full name and to now have first name and last name, then users of your API are going to all of a sudden not be able to use it because the application they're using explicitly expects full name and it's not there. So in that case, you have to version your API. So create a brand new user endpoint that does the exact same thing the old one does, it just has different data. If the data you're sending to a user changes in breaking ways, oh, that was the first one is a data you expect from the user. So it goes both ways. Data you're sending out should also require a change. Or if you're, uh, a, a caveat to all this is eventually uh, you want to get rid of some versions of your API, which become very difficult. So if you have that full name one and you've had it for three years on the internet and you still have users getting it, like at what point can you finally kill it? So it's really important when you start developing APIs to think about that in the beginning so that all your APIs have a minimum version that they support and you can communicate that to your users. So your applications that are consuming it can already say, hey, you're not going to be able to use this system, so just stop doing what you're doing and update your system. So here's an example of an error response. This is Google's. So if you ever interface with any of Google's APIs, this is on their documentation. I just wanted to show it, how they like, they'll return uh, a status code of 400, but then they'll also like give a nice message to send to the user um, so that you don't have to come up with that message yourself. So let's, uh, let's bring up some, uh, a demo and actually uh, look at some of this in action. So there's some C-sharp on your screen that you don't have to know how this works. I'm just going to run this and kind of demonstrate every step of the way, like how these APIs are working. So I have two systems here. One of them is uh, an authentication system that you're going to be able to log into and get a token back from. And the second one is an API that is going to use the front ends or the back end tokens to make sure the user's a valid, a valid user of the system. So I'm loading something called, uh, it used to be called Swagger, it's not called Swagger anymore, it's called Open API. Um, this is also something if you're going to be a back end developer you should become familiar with. Uh, Open API is a way that you can document your API to the outside world. So they don't just have to like willy-nilly guess at where your endpoints are. And you as a developer don't have to write documentation because who, who likes to do that? Um, this specific one, I had a, a separate talk on this at uh, Code of Palooza last year. Uh, uh, if you're a C-sharp backend developer, you can get this for free so all your documentation is written for you. And it's even commented. So if you come in and write a comment in code, that same comment is brought over um, into your Swagger definition. Uh, uh, 
um, as uh, extra information to people using your API so they know what this endpoint is supposed to do. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to hit authorize here and um, uh, Swagger UI here has some information that it's letting me know about like what's going to happen. So I have to authenticate. It's telling me the URL I'm authenticating with. And then down here, I have to say what security uh, level do I need? And this is going to be a problem. There we go. Uh, I want to be an admin and I want to be a public consumer. If you start using big APIs like Facebook or Google's APIs or Twitter, you're going to have to know about these scopes and you have to say exactly what you're going to do with the API before you even start doing it. So now I'm going to hit authorize. And if you notice, a new browser opened, which is the second application, but then it went away. It just closed immediately because I was already logged into that other system. Um, I forgot I was logged in. So let's just go there and log out. Log out. Uh, anybody interested in this code? Um, uh, this is all available on GitHub, and there's a post to it at the end if you do want to look into any uh, C sharp development. So here we go again. So now it's loading that website, and um, I use a password manager. So um, very simple. I'm going to uh, click log in and. All it did there is sent me back to the other website, and it had that JWT token that I was showing you earlier uh, as a URL parameter coming back, which got pulled back off, and now it's able to be used in this system. So I can come in here and I can, like, for instance, try out one of these uh, APIs. So I'm going to hit a get request on the blog's endpoint. So this is going to give me a look. I, I know RESTful development, so I know that I'm going to get a list of blogs back, um, and then I'm going to be able to use those list of blogs to call other things in the system. So here we go. I'm going to hit that. And um, uh, this is uh, called a program called curl, which basically allows you to do the same stuff from the command line. And if you notice here, I've got that big, long JWT token right here under a uh, bearer authorization. And uh, that's the way that the back end knew, knows who I am and knows that I'm allowed to use this system. And, and down here is a response, which is a list of objects. I only have one on here right now, um, which is like one, uh, one blog. But it does have an ID, uh, so um, let's see, actually it has a name. So let's go back, uh, we have a self link here, so I know it's blog number one. So I can come down here to this next blog endpoint, and I can try this out, and I know that blog one is the one that I wanted, so I'm going to click that. And now I've, uh, I've received just one object instead of a list of objects. I can also come down to an admin section of the app, and I can do a post to that same endpoint. Posts or creates. So I can try this out. And I can say I want a new blog. Live demo. And we'll just call this a demo. And now I can execute this, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create two of these because I'm going to now open my uh, F12 tools before the second one is issued. And find it again. And I'm going to execute it a second time with new data. And uh, I want to let's do it a third time. And if you see, oh, we did do the earlier one. 
you see a request came through on my network tab, which was a post and contained the data that I was sending up along with my key. And it got a response back, and the response is the new blog object. So that same response that's, that's shown here. So when you're interfacing with APIs, it's really a good idea to have documentation and some system that people can use it to kind of play around with your API. Uh, almost all of the third party APIs that you might interface with do this. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna uh, execute the list of blogs here. And uh, if you notice, I now have four blogs on this system. And now I can go to things like uh, posts. I can send a new blog post or a comment on top of a post. So this is all a system that revolves around resources. Blogs are a resource, posts are a resource, comments are a resource, and it's all resource driven. And I'm using these verbs to kind of dictate my intent. Uh, any questions around that? Notice a lot of data. Somebody in the back there. Yeah, so yeah. Yes, uh, I have it on my GitHub account, and there's a uh, QR code that I'll bring up at the end and the URL that I'll show you. Good question. Yes, in the middle. for space. Base64 encoding is a little bit more efficient, but there is no real good answer for that, and it makes some developers think that it's secure, and that's why a lot of developers don't check the signature on the end. A lot of libraries, if you're using a library and you say, is this valid? It's going to do the signature checking for, for you, but if you, if you don't check it, then anybody can just like fake these. Good question. Security by obscurity, I guess. Anybody else? All right. Um, I have a second demo that we could uh, try to get through, which is using third party APIs. So let's look at those real quick. Uh, so some uh, third party APIs that you can interface with today uh, in your free time. Uh, first we have the Open Data Initiative from uh, the city of Louisville. It's a very good list of APIs that you can come in and play with. And I don't think I have uh, one of the coolest one that they just released up here. Uh, they just, re everybody know those little like the scooters that you can now rent and kind of ride around? They have the data of every trip that's done on all those scooters. So you can kind of play with that data. Uh, and you can like mash it up with other things like maybe crime data, like uh, you really shouldn't be uh, going through that neighborhood at that time. Uh, what was that? Did somebody say something? Uh, there's the open street maps extract. So uh, the Louisville, uh, Louisville sends data to OpenStreetMaps to populate their, their maps with updated data. So you can see the data that they send to them. You can also see Yelp. So all the, uh, there's a feed that is all of the restaurants in Louisville and their score for their health score. You can tie into that data. Uh, police training, voting precincts, uh, there's a crime API endpoint, so you can see all the crime that's happened. All the street, all the times that a police officer has pulled somebody over, that, that information's uh, available. Uh, pollution, so you can see all the polluters in the city of Louisville and what they put out into the wild. And the, the uh, license that says they're allowed to do that, you can see that. All social media have the APIs because they really want you to use them because when you interface with one of their APIs on your site, they're typically logging that, not for your usage. They're logging the person's data that you're using to access their APIs because they really want to know that they're on your website. 
Um, but who cares? You can make cool products with it. Uh, some fun ones. Uh, there's a Chuck Norris trivia API, a Pokemon API, a NASA has a large collection of APIs that you can see where every uh, orbiting satellite is uh, and uh, all the debris and stuff that's in space. Uh, Swappy is a Star Wars API. A music X match is uh, music lyrics, so you can like interface like music lyrics in with your website. Uh, numbers are just cool numbers. Uh, you can use the countries API, which is really cool because it's impossible to keep track of what all the countries are. But if your system internally needs a drop down list of hey, what country are you in? Like people get mad when their own country is not listed on that list, even if their country is only a few days old. Uh, a brewery database uh, has all the breweries uh, listed in it. Uh, Sport Radar is an interesting one. You can get uh, it, uh, games, uh, like uh, any type of sporting event, uh, basketball, baseball. You can see uh, like when they're going to happen in their schedule. So let's uh, take a look at another real quick demo. Uh, this one is a bit of a live coding demo, but I'm going to skip the live coding section. Um, and uh, so the first thing I did here is I went to Bootstrap's website, which is bing, 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 right here. And I copied and pasted this starter template. No coding. I don't like coding. I like, I like better coders than me, and I just use their stuff. Now, so I pasted it right here into an index.html. And I'm going to add a section here called, uh, with an ID, a div with an ID, if you're in front-end development, of app. And then I have my own little app JavaScript that I'm going to be using. Okay. So now, I want to interface with um, Meetup's API, and I'm going to mash that up with Sports Radars. So you can go to the, you could load this application, and you can say, do I really want to go to Brian's Meetup? Because he's competing with uh, a Louisville basketball game, and I'm going to change my decision. So, if you notice here, uh, the code that I've pre-populated, I have a geolocation in, which isn't necessary unless you want this outside of Louisville. By default, I set it to Louisville. That's the longitude and latitude of Louisville. I just Googled that. And down here, uh, I had to write a little script uh, for getting around cores for one of these APIs, which was well documented. At first, I tried not doing it, and then I was like, oh, hey, course problem. And in the second one, I had to, in order to get around course, I had to actually download the data and store it locally. So I'd have to update this or write a proxy layer. So you don't have to know about all that stuff. But it's really annoying if you're doing front end to back end APIs. Like, if the back end doesn't set their stuff up correctly, then the front end's not going to work. Now, at that point, I had to look at the documentation because I don't know what any of this stuff looks like. So really, all I did is I pulled up what does the payload look like that I'm getting from the NCA Men's Division I Basketball Tournament. And I kind of had to look in here and just figure out what I needed to do. Uh, I'm using a browser plugin or a plugin to Notepad++ so I can collapse uh, JSON objects so I can see what's going on. Okay, rounds, that looks promising. And I've got a first round here, and it has an Eastern region name, so I'm getting more promising. So it's rounds bracket, and then the bracket has, bracketed has games. So if I want to get to these games, all I have to do is go to rounds, bracketed, games, and a games is an array as well. And then I can pull up, you know, the the two 
the home team and the away team. I can get that information. Now, uh, so that's pretty easy. Uh, Meetup, I can look here and I just have an events. I can just pull events, it's just an array of events. And those have timestamps. And in my query, I'm ordering by time. So I don't have to worry about reordering this list to make sure it's in the right list, right order. So really, all I need to do is add some like calculation magic. So first off, I have to go through every round, just a for loop for those front end developers. Then I need to go through another for loop for all the brackets. And then a final for loop for all the games. So I'm just going rounds, brackets, games. And then I'm just going through each one. Because my events are in order, I can just go through the events one at a time and say, have I gone too far? Oh, well, I can stop looking because this is in the future compared to this, uh, this event. So that's what this little while loop is for. That if my events uh, ended before this game ever started, then I'm on the wrong event. I need to go to the next event. If the events overlap, if my ball game overlaps my meetup, then I've got a, I've got a hit. So I've got to show this to the user. And all I did here is I went back to GitHub, or back to uh, Bootstrap, and I went to their documentation, and I went to their layout, nope, their content, and I looked for components. Cards. And then I found the card, the simple card, which is here, and once again I copied and pasted that, and I brought it back over. So over here, we said that this here is just copied and pasted, and then that one little section here that says this is some text within a card. I'm just uh, oh, wrong with it. taking the game away name, which I had to look in that uh, JSON object to see the game home name and the event name, and I'm just like putting them all together, and now. If the stars align and I didn't mess something up, I should be able to go to this endpoint here. I have it hosted in the same app, and it's just index.html, and uncock syntax, and control Z. I moved some stuff around because of uh, uh, better readability and better decoding. That's why you shouldn't uh, do live coding demos. You know, who cares? JS line 10. Oh, unclosed quote. That's no good. Inherent click. I had this where I could copy and paste it in, and I know that worked, but uh, unfortunately I didn't want to get into uh, live coding coding. And of course, <coughs> always gets you. to get the response back. My bad. So we now have North Carolina at North Dakota versus the Software Guild Louisville. 
So uh, we could just add some thumbs up and thumbs down to this, start collecting some data. The Oregon Ducks at Wisconsin Bathers at the uh, versus the Kentucky Community College Women in Computing. These are all the tech events, by the way. I did filter the tech events only. The Iowa Hawkeyes at the Cincinnati Bearcats versus the Kentucky Community College Women in Computing. It's going to be a tough day there. Uh, they're overlapping a lot of events. So these APIs are very simple to uh, inter integrate with uh, as long as you give them enough time to load. Um, and I will do my last slide here, which is my GitHub repository. Uh, so thanks for coming out. Uh, this repository has an, another talk that I do on uh, principles of good API design. So there's a PowerPoint presentation you can look at if you want to kind of explore the next level. There are a lot of the beginning slides are the same, but uh, the content is uh, is fairly different. All right. Any more questions? Good. Yes. So you typically interact with these APIs in JavaScript. Uh, so you um, yes. Just because that's the easiest, but if you're going to make it a production-worthy thing, you should have it a layer on your own server that does the communication. Because unfortunately, your app, your API keys are exposed if you're in JavaScript, uh, which can be bad, cannot be bad. You might have to swap them out. But uh, JavaScript's the fastest way to get it done, and really wanted to target the front-end developer audience for this. So yeah, good question. Anybody else? Yeah. So, uh, using third-party APIs, what methods are there mitigating integration needs are? Like you talked about with Facebook and such, how just having the that they will go ahead and call it a bit more that integration. Um, so, uh, legally, their API definition states that you're not allowed to block them from getting, collecting the information. Because basically, anytime that you're getting value from a website for free, then you are the product being sold to the users. Like, nothing is free on the web. I mean, software developers, they make a pretty good living. And so to build these APIs, to build this infrastructure, is not free. So if you're getting it for free, then you're the product. Uh, unless they have a scale where you're like, if you use it a thousand times a day, you're fine. And then any more than that, like you have to pay. In those cases, it's just sort of like giving you a taste, so then you have to start paying. But, but usually there isn't a way. You could do caching on the back end if you wanted to, so you could put a proxy layer in. So all the requests from the users are coming to you, and you save the data there. But the bad part is you're probably breaking some terms of service by doing that. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So if somebody wants to try and learn this for their first time. Was it any good resources you recommend that have some good tutorials or? Uh, really the best uh, option is to go to the documentation on the resource that you want to learn about the most. So use like that slide earlier and find something that you think is cool. Because uh, each API is gonna be slightly different to interact with. Like some of them you have to download the data. So I know Louisville's data, like a lot of it is available, but it's just a file. So if you want any intelligent parsing, you kind of have to download that. Um, but other than that, like documentation, that's probably your best bet because most of these APIs also even have example code. So if you're going to be a C-sharp developer, they'll have a library already written, an API already written in C-sharp that does this stuff for you. And so you can say just like, you know, uh, service.get.people. And then now you have all the people. So it's, that's probably your best bet. Good question. Yeah. If you wanted to create a, uh, an API, is C Sharp the main language that you would use to, to do that? Or do you use like other languages? Uh, there are a lot of good languages, but C Sharp's the best. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, that's what I use. That's that's what I'm an expert in. So, like, I can do it in Ruby, Ruby on Rails. 
I can do it in PHP, but I'm going to do it a bit faster in C sharp, so that's what I use. I think it's fair to say Louisville is primarily a dynamic. Yes, it'll also help you get a job. So in Louisville. Louisville would help you get a job. Yeah. If you if you wrote an API, like this blog API, and posted it on just like a free website, like that is a resume in and of itself. Like, look at this API, go look at it. It has security, it has all these features, and I understand those features. That that's a resume. Good question. And that's why Brian pushes for these projects. Like those projects are meant to be like it's your, it's your resume. Look, I built built this. This is what I can do. Yeah. Any more questions? Is your presentation available anywhere? Uh, it is also in the same GitHub repository, along with the other presentation I was just talking about. Yes, the code is in here in there as well. Uh, and there's a readme that that, should, that says how to set it up. You do have to have two products. You have to have Visual Studio Community. Now, I just use Community. Like um, you have to have SQL Server Management Studio uh, to run a SQL script that kind of pre-sets things up on the security. Good question. So let's thank Daniel for coming out and talking. <laughs> so um, just a couple quick things. Uh, the uh, April meetup, uh, our speaker is going to be Dr. Angelique Johnson. Uh, she is a uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Menstem. And she has quite the interesting background. Her bio is up on the, uh, the next meetup uh, page. Um, so that'll be mid-April. Um, and uh, she'll be talking about digital inclusion uh, and basically kind of linking up entrepreneurship and basically how technology can kind of uh, open up avenues for everybody. Um, I want to thank uh, Waystar for hosting us, particularly Larry, who is uh, a big door man and make sure that this place is available for us. And uh, also, the next one will uh, have a sponsor, so that means food. So, another reason to come. So, we're going to be there next month. Um, as always, if you ever have any ideas or anything, uh, just send them my way. Always looking for uh, feedback on what you all want to hear about. Uh, or if you want to give a talk yourself, I'm even open to that. And you don't have to be an expert in the field to be able to convey information. Uh, so if that interests you, let me know. We can talk about it. Um, and yeah, that should do it. So uh, good little folks, uh, if you didn't already and you want this to count for one of your, your meetup credits, talk to Shannon over here. She, uh, so that we don't have to send a message uh, you know, later tonight or tomorrow morning. Don't go. Have a good night. And uh, I'm up here if anybody has any further questions. Just